Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the NPTEL MOOC's course on Phonetics and Phonology, a broad overview. This is the third unit of this course and in the preceding two units we have learnt a bit about articulatory phonetics and acoustic phonetics. And uh, now in this uh, unit we will have a look at the sounds of the world's languages. Uh, we have already looked at articulatory phonetics and acoustic phonetics. So, what is new about this section? In, in the previous two sections, we only looked at the most commonly occurring features in uh, articulatory phonetics. So, in this unit, we will look at the broad range of uh, choices available for articulation. So, in a sense, we will have a look at the phonetic diversity in the world's languages. And uh, in the previous lecture, we concentrated mainly on English and other major languages. In this unit, we will look more closely at all the different aspects of articulation that is available for us from different languages of the world. This lecture is uh, the unit is based a lot on the sounds of world's languages by Ladi Forget in Madison, 1996. So, languages in the world, there are about 6 to 7000 languages in the world and most languages are spoken by fewer than 10,000 people, a quarter spoken by under 1000 people. Um, Language is a dialect with an army and a navy. This is an off quoted saying in linguistics, uh, which you may or may not agree with. But what it says is that uh, language, the decision to arrive at a, uh, what is a language vis a vis what is a dialect, is arrived upon by considerations such as mutual intelligibility and other social and political factors. So, it has been predicted, um, a very ominous prediction that we will be left with less than half of the languages that we currently have in the world in the next century. And we have a whole range of endangered languages in various parts of the world. When the next generation of young people speak, other social economically powerful languages, about half of the world speak one of the 10 largest languages and among them we have English, Mandarin, Arabic, Hindi, Spanish and a few other languages. So, there have been many ways of viewing how this language endangerment is going to impact us as a species, as human species. And it has been said that just as plant geneticists will suffer because of loss of biodiversity in the understanding of possible plant genes, cognitive scientists of um, human language will also uh, have to deal with lesser diversity in languages and the range of available languages to study will be severely limited. So, uh, this will be a detrimental factor because a human language depends on our knowledge about various things in the world, depends on our knowledge of what is language, what are the possible uh, languages that a human cognitive system is able to 
come up with. So, those considerations are important to understand uh, our human cognitive abilities. Now, uh, having had this brief overview about the state of languages in the world, we move on to study uh, phonetic diversity. So, in the lectures on place of articulation, we have looked at different locations of articulation. So, there are five major parts of the vocal tract and we have seen that there are the movable parts and there are lip tongue and blade of the tongue and then uh, the tip of the tongue is called apical, the center part of the tongue is called laminal. In this lecture, we will see those distinctions. So, the body of the tongue is behind the blade and articulations made with this surface are called dorsa. Now, these are the these are the places of articulation that we have been talking about and these are highlighted in blue in the picture in front of you. So, we can see the two lips and we can see the tongue tip, we can see the body of the tongue, the blade of the tongue and root and the glottis. These are the movable structures along with the lips. And now, in figure 2, what we see is what we can call place of articulation. So, here we saw the movable structures, here we see what we call um, the immovable or more precisely in recent studies of in linguistics, we call these the target areas. So, these are the target areas for the movable articulators. And the 17 named articulatory gestures, so when uh, the movement towards a target is called a gesture. So, the, the 17 named articulatory gestures are um, seen in this diagram. And um, what we see here is the dental, the alveolus. So, what we can see that the tongue moves and it can move to post alveolar or palate alveolar region, the alveolar region and the dental region. So, uh, either the tongue tip or the tongue blade. So, depending on so whether if it is a tongue tip, it will be an apical gesture, if it is a tongue blade, it will be the laminal gesture. So, depending on um, what sounds you are producing, uh, there will be the difference in the, the part of the tongue which is used, it could be either apical or laminal. So, um, figure 1 and 2 show movable structures forming active articulators targets and what moves towards them are shown in figure 2 and we saw the target regions and Having talked about this, now we um, want to present before you briefly what is the articulatory phonology model by Brownman and Colstein. Articulatory phonology is the central role is assigned is movements, the role is uh, of movements uh, and it is described in terms of abstract gestural prototypes and these coordinate with other gestures for different degrees of overlap and we use the term gesture to refer to a generalized pattern of movement in this lecture following much of the literature in articulatory phonology. So, we have seen the different the range of different art locations of articulation, the movable parts. So, here are the movable parts, here are the you see 17 regions, but the 9 regions here are the uh, target areas, the ones that cannot move. So, th we have uh, the target areas here. So, we have dental alveolar, the post alveolar palatal velar, all these regions are the uh, target areas. So, uh, now moving on to place of articulation, uh, what is called alveolar. So, we have these pairings between active articulator and targets, which we will see in another diagram. And the traditional descriptions imply both active articulator and target. So, the traditional descriptions that we saw previously in articulatory phonetics, 
those are sometimes not sufficient and they imply both the articulator and the target. For instance, when we say that a sound is uh, labiodental, we do not know it is not specified in the traditional description which part is the movable articulator, which part is not. So, here as you can see in this diagram, you can see that this tongue tip can, can move to the post alveolar region, the alveolar region, the dental region, the labial region, etcetera. So, and now the tongue blade can move to the post alveolar region, the alveolar region, dental region and also the labial regions both the lips here also both. So, the tongue tip can actually move to all these places, the tongue blade can move to these three places. So, um, so basically if we divide the roof of our vocal tract into the dental, alveolar and post alveolar regions, then we can have either apical or laminal or neither actually and we can have either apical or laminal gestures movements. So, in an apical gesture the tongue will move towards the tongue tip will move towards I, any of these positions in a laminal gesture the tongue blade will move towards these positions. And when that happens, this group of sounds are called coronals. Having looked at coronals, where the tongue tip and tongue blade can move towards the various regions that is dental, alveolar, post alveolar and labial regions, we now have a look at labials. So, the most commonly uh, found sounds for labials are the bilabial sounds or the bilabial gesture. So, bilabials more than other stops are more likely to have incomplete gestures and they are also that is why likely to have fricativized allophones. There are also labiodental stops, there are labiodental nasals, there are also lingual labials. So, this is a data set from a language called Tsonga, it is a, a dialect of Tsonga and the labial consonants here show that they have labiodental fricative, labiodental affricate, bilabial fricative and bilabial plosive and which may be either voiceless unaspirated, voiceless aspirated voiced or breathy voiced. So, while we have seen earlier that bilabials are not difficult to understand. We will play those videos again to show the bilabial gesture when the two lips come together and the labiodental gesture where the lip move towards the upper teeth and these two are commonly found um, sound the target as well as the origin of the sound. So, we have uh, bilabial plosives, bilabial fricatives, labiodental affricates and labiodental fricatives in this data here. So, we already saw the indication the major movements from one uh, articulated region to another showing the targets, showing the gestures and showing the movement from a neutral position towards the target. So, um, now let us again begin from the dental region. So, we have looked at coronal how we can have uh, the laminal and the apical gestures where the uh, tongue tip and tongue blade can move either towards the dental region um, or towards the uh, alveolar region or post alveolar region where uh, labiodental sounds are concerned or and dental sounds are concerned. The dental sounds are very commonly found in languages of the world. There is a difference there between interdental sounds and dental sounds. So, the difference between interdental and dental is that in the production of interdental the tip of the tongue moves between the teeth whereas in the production of the canonical dental sounds the tip of the tongue makes a obstruction around the back of the upper teeth. So, uh, there can be differences in the dental sound. So, there if 
mm, they could be apical dental and interdental. So, uh, Malayalam sounds have a difference um, sometimes and these are not contrastive sounds and there are variations. So, languages are known to contrast dental and alveolar stops. This is very common contrast in the languages of the world. However, it may be accompanied by a difference in laminality. So, what does this mean? Apart from the distinction that the, the contrast is being made by is the tongue makes an obstruction in either the dental region or alveolar region, there is a difference in laminality which means the gesture is not the same. So, even though if it is a contrast based on dental and alveolar, there are further differences based on the way the tongue moves. So, if it is um, the tip of the tongue, then it is an apical gesture. Remember, if it is a tongue blade, then it is a laminal gesture. And apart from the dental and alveolar contrast, there can be a difference in laminality. So, there could be apical dental, laminal dental, apical alveolar and laminal alveolar. So, in Malayalam as we just talked about, uh, dental stops are laminal and alveolar stops are apical. So, apart from the distinction of place of articulation of dental and alveolar, the gestures could also be different as in they could be either laminal or apical. Apart from the laminal and uh, apical gestures which are involved in making the contrast between alveolar and dental, there are other aspects in the way the gestures that the tongue can make. So, we show toda palodograms and lingograms which show uh, how these apical, dental, laminal, alveolar and retroflex uh, sounds are um, the gestures where do they make an impact in that region of dental, alveolar or retroflex. As you can see uh, what from what is visible for the dental it is apical. So, if for palatograms and lingograms uh, it involves a process which involves painting the tongue tip blade in front with edible oil and charcoal and a video camera and mirrors are placed in the mouth uh, showing the places um, uh, where the contact has been made. And in the Toda case, we see that the tip and blade of the tongue contact with the upper front teeth and alveolar ridge, uh, showing that these are laminal denti alveolar stops. So, as you can see, the contact made are different for all these three places. So, whereas one is denti alveolar, denti apical, the other is alveolar laminal involving the blade of the tongue, here it was the tip of the tongue and retroflex as we will see as we move along they are sub apical and they are not uh, either apical or laminal. So, the alveolar can be uh, apical alveolar, the retroflex can be sub apical. One important distinction that is to be understood is that if a language has a dental and alveolar contrast and then very often the dental sound will be laminal and the alveolar will be apical. And very few languages have dental stops which are apical. So, most of the time the gesture for dental sounds is always apical, the gesture for alveolar sounds would always be laminal. So, we will see a bit more with regard to retroflexes here and Ladifugid and Bhaskar Rao have shown that languages can differ in the kind of retroflexion they employ. So, we will see the typical tongue positions for the retroflex consonants in Tamil and, and Telugu, two Dravidian languages and Hindi and Indo-Aryan language. So, um, the Dravidian languages typically have sub-apical consonants. Uh, in which the underside of the tongue contacts the anterior of the hard palate. So, the gesture in the case of the Dravidian languages is a sub apical consonant, whereas with regard to Hindi, 
we do not usually have the tongue tip curl so far back and therefore the contact is only only is apical whereas uh, in dravidian languages it can be called subapical so um, the dravidian languages are therefore best known to have subapical retroflex stops and uh, importantly uh, the acoustics of retroflexes also show that the overall acoustic pattern in the we, we find f2 f3 f4 in a relatively narrow frequency region much greater form and transitions from a vowel into a retroflex consonant than into a following vowel. So, this is what we have talked about just now. So, in Hindi the retroflexion is apical. In both Tamil and Telugu we find subapical that is the surface behind the tongue tip making a gesture to form the retroflexion. So, Bulgarian has apical and alveolar nasals and we can see the slight difference here in the gestures between the apical and the laminal alveolar nasals. So, very few languages have these distinctions and Bulgarian is known to have this. So, now uh, let us again have a look at the distinctions that we just talked about. In the labial place of articulation, we can have uh, bilabial and labiodental. These are the major place features. Where la laminal is concerned, we can have lingual labial. Uh, so, where the tongue can make contact with the lips and we can have lingual labial, we can have interdental, we can have laminal dental, we can have laminal alveolar and we can have laminal post alveolar or palatal alveolar. Where the apical gesture is concerned, we can have apical dental, apical alveolar, apical post alveolar and in a sub apical gesture, we can have the palatal retroflex. Apart from that, we also have palatal sounds, velar, uvular, pharyngeal and epiglottal which are the radical sounds and finally, we have the laryngeal place of articulation where the glottal sounds are produced. So, let us have a look at um, some of these sounds again and we can see that we can have labial stops, we can have labial nasals, we can have labial fricatives and uh, we can also have we do not have labiodental stops, we can have labiodental nasals, we can have labiodental approximants and we can have labiodental uh, fricatives, but um, some of these stops etcetera are not possible. So, all the gaps are not filled and these are the diacritics, the various diacritics that can be used for uh, sounds and whenever there is a circle underneath the sound, it means a voiceless, uh, devoiced voiceless sound and sometimes voicing is added to voiceless sounds and then we have this. Uh, diacritic and then we have aspiration, roundedness, advanced, retracted, centralized, mid centralized, syllabic again and when a consonantal sound is syllabic, we have a diacritic for that non syllabic, rhotic is shown with that curl there and then breathy voice with two dots, creaky voice, lingual label and labialized, these are secondary articulations, palatalized velarized, pharyngealized and dental apical and laminal uh, nasalized, nasal release, lateral release and no audible release. And some more for uh, velarized, pharyngealized, raised, lowered, advanced tongue root and retracted tongue root. So, this is the full list of diacritics which are available and some of these distinction we have just considered extensively now apical, laminal for instance lingual labial etcetera. So, place of articulation again. So, the UPSID database mm, which is uh, patterns of sounds uh, surveys 317 languages of which 314 have bilabial stops, 316 have alveolar dental stops and 315 have 
uh, velar stops. So we can see that these are the most commonly found place of articulation. And um, we have seen earlier, so what, what those place of articulations are. So we have uh, for bilabial the lips, for labiodental it is the lower lip making a contact with the upper teeth and for dental sound it is the um, tip of the tongue here making a contact with the upper teeth. We will look at palatal sounds, velar sounds and uvular sounds in the rest of the lecture. Also pharyngeal sounds and glottal sounds. Most of the sounds will be voiced or voiceless, so that is the state of the glottis. So, we just talked about palatals, so that is the palatal region. So, let us look at uh, this language spoken in uh, Cameroon. So, Ngo has uh, palatals versus velars. So, the first sound is the laminal denti alveolar, the second one is the laminal palato alveolar. The Third one Again. is the palatal, the fourth one Again. is velar. So, uh, this is the Again. palatal stop that we are talking about in Ngo. So, these are the three different types of retroflex sounds that are possible, and you can see in the diagrams that whereas Hindi is um, apical and Tamil and Telugu have slightly different uh, way of producing the retroflex that is subapical that is the, the part of the tongue tip which is used is the part which is below the uh, tongue tip. So, the curling uh, goes way back and the, the portion below the tongue tip which is used for producing the retroflex. The uh, relationship between the major place features and individual places of articulation can be seen in the staple. And we can see that with the lips very many uh, articulations are possible. So, we can see that uh, the lips uh, can produce bilabial and labiodental sounds and along with uh, the tongue you can have lingolabial or uh, interdental or laminal dental, laminal alveolar and laminal post alveolar. So, in the coronal gesture, we can have the apical dental, apical alveolar and apical post alveolar. The sub apical is restricted to the retroflex sounds. And then in the dorsal region, we can have palatal, velar, uvular sounds and also uh, the ones which are called radical are pharyngeal, epiglottal and the laryngeal one is glottal, the radical ones are pharyngeal and epiglottal. So, these are the major place features and uh, again I repeat that we did not see these distinctions when we studied place of articulation or when we, we when we looked at articulatory phonetics, we looked at only the very basic places like labial, dental, alveolar and post alveolar and velar. So, you can see that there are very many more places of articulation available that are, are possible in the languages of the world. So, these are the labials which are possible and are found in languages and these are IPA symbols that you see here. Um, so, we have per, ber, which are the stops and ma which is ma uh, bilabials stop and the labio uh, dental uh, nasal ma and uh, here we have a trill. Okay, and we have a uh, labiodental as well, and we have these you know, fricatives, bilabial fricatives, labiodental fricatives, and uh, also an approximant. So uh, all these possibilities are there in the languages of the world. And however, among these, so the bilabial stops and the labiodental stops, uh, along with the 
bilabial fricatives are commonly seen. The trills and the labiorental nasals are there in languages, but not as common as the bilabial stop and the labiodental fricatives and also the uh, bilabial fricatives are found more often in the languages as well. So, in the uh, database of Madison's patterns of languages to uh, we have a survey of 317 languages of which 314 have bilabial stops, 316 have alveolar dental stops and 315 have velar stops. So, we have already seen these places of articulation. Coming now to the other places of articulation for instance palatals. The palatals here we can see they are palatal stops, we have palatal nasals, we have palatal fricative and palatal approximants. We do not have palatal trills etcetera unlike the uh, labials. So, how is a um, palatal sound produced? The root of tongue uh, makes a constriction and goes to the back wall of the pharynx. So, root of the tongue moves towards the, the target is the back wall of pharynx and that gives us these sounds. So, among 317 languages, 59 languages were found to have palatal stops. These are the palatograms of um, the articulatory positions of laminal uh, denti alveolar as we know the laminal sound is produced by the uh, blade of the tongue and then we have laminal palatal alveolar again the blade of the tongue and then we have the palatal stop which is at the back of the tongue making a just a movement towards the roof of the mouth. In Quechua which is spoken in South America, in Bolivia and uh, Peru also we have Chaka, Chaka, Chaka. So, how do we pronounce uh, epiglottals? Epiglottals are produced by uh, putting the back wall um, the epiglottis to the back of the pharyngeal region. So, um, the fricatives are rare and the phonemic contrast between uh, pharyngeal and epiglottal place is also extremely rare. So, here are the epiglottals in Agul no. spoken in Dagestan, no. the voice pharyngeal fricative, no. voiceless pharyngeal fricative, voiceless epiglottal fricative, no. No. another voiceless epiglottal. No. So, we have um, labialized velar stops from um, Idoma which is a language Abba. spoken in Nigeria. So, that is a labial Abba. labial velar Abba. velar versus the labial. Abba. So, among velars we have stops, nasals, fricatives and approximants. So, we have the stops, nasals, fricatives, approximants and Limak, tate, navet. These are lingual labials. Lingual labials which are produced um, by touching the blade of the tongue to the upper lip. So, the examples are from Venin taught a language spoken in Vanuatu. So, there is a language called Yanwa, which is uh, spoken in the Northern Territory in Australia, which has seven stop place contrast and which is what we will play in the next slide. That is bilabial, laminal dental, apical alveolar, Apical retroflex, Uchola. palato alveolar, Cocolo. front velar, 
Go, go, go. The back velar. So, there is a the dental and the alveolar are different in terms of their gesture of laminal versus apical. And the retroflex is apical, and then there is a palatal alveolar, and there is a front velar, and there is a back velar. So, languages the velars can have a distinction based on the part of the velic region which is the target of the gesture. So, you could either have a front velar or a back velar. So, another language uh, Nungubuyu, uh, which has uh, these different stop positions. So, there is a dental T, the alveolar T, and there is a retroflex T and a palatal alveolar CH. So, um, whereas it might seem that it is difficult to have um, both dental alveolar retroflex and palatal alveolar, but uh, there are very many languages, if not uh, um, very common, there are quite a few languages which have these four contrasts. And the dental alveolar retroflex, uh, palatal alveolar is seen in a few languages. So, um, coming now to the final uh, analysis, languages most commonly will have bilabial dental or alveolar and velar contrast. This is seen quite often in language as well. Uh, if they have one more contrast, then that could be palatal or uvular. And additionally, if there is another contrast, it could be retroflex. Furthermore, if there is a uh, there is a fifth place of articulation that the language could have that is sometimes labial velar. So, uh, these are the possibilities that we have in terms of place of articulation of uh, mainly stops. Coming now to uh, manner of articulation. So, we have already seen these uh, differences in the um, previous a lecture on a manner of articulation and articulatory phonetics. So, this is a plosive which requires a complete closure and, and a release. Then we have nasal where you have a closure in the mouth and the lowering of the velum and the air released through the nasal cavity. Then we have others like trill etcetera and you can see the rapid movement which against the articulators rapid um, movement against each other and that produces a trill. And then we have others like a tap which is one tap against the moving articulator moving making a gesture towards the um, uh, towards the alveolar region and making one tap unlike the trill where you have repeated um, rapid movements. So, and then fricative we, we have a closure, but it is partial and we have a very slow release. And then we have um, others like lateral fricative. So, what is the difference between centralized fricative and a lateral fricative? Lateral fricative the release will be through both sides of the articulators, whereas in centralized fricative it will be through the center. And then we have uh, approximants where we have a gesture of moving towards of one articulator towards the other articulator and then there is a even though there is a closure it is um, not as um, as strong as that of a stop and then we have lateral approximants just like lateral fricative where the release is through the both sides of the articulators. So, we have uh, in the languages of the world quite a few lateral fricatives. So, these are the symbols that we have um, for these lateral fricatives and then um, we have lateral approximants. So, there are four lateral approximants and two lateral fricatives which are uh, possible in the languages of the world. 
Now, uh, summarizing uh, the various distinctions that we saw, uh, we still have to discuss airstream mechanism direction which we will proceed to uh, in uh, a few minutes. And then uh, we saw that the glottal start state is important, the, the state of the larynx and the um, part of the tongue which is employed the apical versus laminal versus dorsal versus subapical these distinctions are important to uh, to characterize sounds and then uh, the primary place of articulation and the manner of articulation centrality nasality these are the additional considerations that we have to keep in mind while discussing uh, the articulatory aspects of sounds so um, some other things that we have to keep in mind, voiceless nasals for instance, uh, nasalization and fricatives are not compatible. So, there are very many reasons as to why that is not often seen and uh, very few nasal fricatives which have been um, attested in the languages of the world have been uh, a bit controversial. So, it is often disputed. Uh, however, voiceless nasals are found in the languages of words. Na, so, we na, have Burmese here. Na, na, nya, 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 nya. Those were the distinctions between bilabial, dental, palatal and velar. Those are voiceless nasals versus these voice na. ones. Na, 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 nya, 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 nya. Another manner that we have not discussed extensively uh, so far that is trills. So, trill as we saw in the video before this, two articulators open and close against each other rapidly and kele is a language spoken in New Guinea in the island of Manus and it is thus both bilabial and alveolar trills. That is the bilabial trill. That is also the bilabial trill and here is the alveolar trill. This brings us to the discussion on airstream uh, mechanism. So, as we had previously uh, discussed, the air that we use to produce sounds is pushed out from the lungs, then we have the, we use the pulmonic airstream or we can use the air trapped inside the glottis, then it is the glottalic airstream or we can use the air from the velaric region and then we have the velar airstream. And apart from um, the airstream mechanism where the air is pushed out from pulmonic, glottalic or velaric, we also have direction. So, the most common direction is aggressive, the air pushed out from the lungs is normally almost all the time that is the airstream which is used. However, there are also instances of ingressive airstream where air is um, inhaled in and the sound is produced uh, as a result of that inhalation. So, pulmonic airstream, the air uh, inside the lungs, uh, the glottalic airstream air used here inside and the velaric air in the velic region. So, along with the airstream mechanism, we can also have a direction which is it could be either aggressive and as if we have aggressive then we have like stop consonants, um, plosives etcetera pulmonic aggressive, almost all sounds are produced with the pulmonic aggressive airstream. However, we have a few other ways of producing sounds and one is glottalic with aggressive and ingressive. So, ejectives are the uh, glottalic aggressive sounds, the ingressive are the, uh, the voice, uh, the stop consonants which can be produced uh, as a result of the glottalic ingressive airstream and implosives are the result of those. So, as a result of glottalic aggressive we can have ejectives 
and as a result of glottalic ingressive we can have implosives. Now the third uh, airstream mechanism that is velaric. So one particular very unique sound is produced as a result of this, this is known as clicks. So as we have just discussed making speech sounds involves airstream mechanism and moving air by exhaling from the lungs is the pulmonic aggressive airstream. And apart from the pulmonic aggressive we have the glottalic aggressive uh, which produces e ejective sounds and then the production of glottalic uh, aggressive involves closures in the vocal tract and the vocal fold and the compressed air is released with high pressure. So now we know that some sounds are made without air flowing out of the lungs and one of them is also ejectives. The symbols which are used for production of ejectives are these. So you can see the apostrophe on top of the stops, this is used for ejectives. So um, sounds made with glottalic aggressive airstream is um, they are known as ejectives. Here are some examples of ejectives. <laughs> Uh, Chaka is spoken in um, South America and we have already shown the Quechua examples of palatal sounds. Now we have this distinction Quechua has uh, ejectives which we will hear. Chaka, uh, Chaka. This is the palatal alveolar ejective. Vila ejective. Kalu, Kalu. Uvular ejective. So we saw the uh, glottalic uh, aggressive, how do you produce it? Close the glottis, sort of the gestures involved for producing a glottal stop. There has to be a closure, the glottis is raised and it is released, the air rushes out and creating a, from high pressure to a low pressure. And the air rushes out making a glottal stop, but the air used for producing the sound is the air trapped in the glottalic region. So unlike ejectives we have implosives which is made at the air which is coming inside into the mouth. So it involves uh, dropping the closed glottis and an obstruction and then the sound uh, made in this way are called then implosives are very often found in languages such as Sindhi and here Bunny. are the implosives that we are playing here. Bunny. Gun. Gun. Bun. Bun. Gun. Gun. So. Gun. Bunny. You could hear the. Bunny. Field. So, to summarize, the glottalic ingressive airstream is uh, used for the production of implosives. Air is forced into the mouth there is a closure in mouth and at the vocal folds, there is downward movement of the larynx that is because of the air that is drawn into the mouth, there is lowered pressure, there is also there has to be an expansion of the vocal tract because there are strong vibrations and that is how you produce a ingressive, glottalic ingressive airstream implosive. We have seen that to produce the glottalic aggressive one we had for ejectives, the, it was the air which was already going out of the mouth but for ingressive the air has to be pushed in so and that results in a lowering of the glottis. So we have seen ejectives, we have seen implosives, now we move on to the villaric airstream which is the, used in the production of clicks. So clicks are produced with two closures. Here is an example from Xhosa, southwest western uh, Africa. One is a dental click, alveopalatal click, and alveolar lateral. That is from Isi Xhosa, a uh, language spoken in uh, southwestern Africa. So these are the movements in the production of a click. So there has to be a cavity and the light shade it shows area shows the cavity just before the release of the front closure and 
the lines in between shows the lower tongue region uh, which is responsible for uh, change in the pressure uh, in the production of the click. So, the back of the tongue raises to form a, a closure and the tongue tip goes up to form the front closure. So, we have two closures. Finally, both closures are held, the body of the tongue moves down, decreasing the pressure of the air in the front part of the mouth. So, there are two closures and the body of the tongue goes down. And the tongue tip lowers so that the air rushes out and it makes a large sound and also and the back closure is released. So, here is a convention click from the Ladu Forget website uh, UCLA which is freely available. The, so, clicks are produced with anterior and posterior closure and a pocket of air is created and when the front closure is released air rushes into the mouth and a negative pressure and rapid inflow creates a very loud sound that is one of the identifying properties of clicks that they make a loud sound. So, uh, repeating what we had earlier seen in the diagram to produce for instance an alveolar click one has to make two oral closures and the tongue is pulled down creating a low pressure area and the front oral closure is released, air rushes into equalized pressure and the back closure is released after that. So, these are some Zulu clicks and this is Santa, 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 dental, Kaka. alveolar Kaka. and alveolar lateral. So, we have included spectrograms to show the release of the click. So, you can see sort of release with almost two releases because of the two closures alveopalatal, alveolar lateral, then we have a dental, kaka, 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 and alveolar lateral. Toba, toba, toba. These are the diagrams of clicks of the movement required to produce clicks. So, for a bilabial, you can see that there is a closure at the lips and there is a closure at the back, and for dental, closure at the dental region as well as a closure there at the back of the tongue, making another closure the roof of the tongue and alveolar closure again we've discussed this that at the alveolar region the tongue tip makes a closure and another closure at the back and for palatal same that we need two closures for lateral also um, we need a, a similar closure like the alveolar one but it's just that the release is different for the, the lateral. Now so far we have covered place of articulation manner of articulation and um, also airstream and the direction of airstream. So, you can the either whether the sounds are pulmonic, glottalic or velaric and along with that whether the air is pushed out of the lungs or the glottal region then we would have the aggressive sounds or the air is brought inside the mouth and then the air rushing in is um, released uh, because uh, after being trapped in either the uh, glottalic region or the uh, velaric region and then we produce the ingressive sounds. So, after that there are other factors which influ color the sounds that we produce. The, uh, that what we have not discussed so much is that of the state of the glottis. We have only discussed voiced and voiceless. There could be other properties such as murmured, laryngealized and closed. So, part of the tongue involved you could have apical, laminal, dorsal we could also have subapical and then we have these various places of articulation that we have uh, shown so far that we have palatal, uh, velar, uh, uvular and pharyngeal. Also labial velar along with the ones that we had discussed before bilabial, labiodental, dental, alveolar, retroflex, 
alveopalatal, palatoalveolar, palatal, velar, uvular, pharyngeal and labial velar. So, we have discussed manner of articulation extensively, stop, fricative, approximant, trill, flap, tap and affricate. Centrality also has been discussed whether the air is released centrally or laterally from both sides. There could be difference in nasality, the sounds could be oral or nasal. So, finally, these are the symbols that are used for the various sounds that we have discussed so far the plosives, nasals, trills, tap, flap and fricatives, lateral fricative, approximant, lateral approximants and then the uh, manner of articulation clicks, voice implosives, ejectives. So, we have covered pretty much a lot of the complexities involved in the production of sounds and we will continue discussing this in the next two classes. Thank you for your attention and we will see you again in the next class.